Hypocrisy. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to Late Explaining the Interwebs. I'm your host, Nick Ricada. Oh, my God. Of Ricada Law. What? The, what? A small law firm in Central Minnesota. What is his hair doing? What a disaster. Hey, uh, yeah, the obvious thing. Super late. Um, I'm going to tell you. Look, I'm going to tell you about it in a non-complaining way. And we'll use it as a story. Okay? We'll use, a, uh, we'll use it as a story. Why I was late actually um, is a story about one of the things I, I care very deeply about, and it involves, hey, look, we're talking Christianity again. This time we're talking about the church. And so I'll use it productively uh, and tell you about my exceedingly high amounts of frustration with today and anger, which is not my favorite thing to have. Um, but we'll do that. We also have some other, uh, we have some other, st uh, topics, stories, topics, topics, we call them. Um, we've got Oregon recriminalizing drugs, the hard drugs, the good drugs. They had this plan. They're like, oh, liberalism will work. We'll decriminalize all the drugs. Right. And it didn't work so well. So now they're like, no, we're going to undo that. And this is where I conflict with like libertarianism is not in. I guess principle, but in speed and scale. Um, I think that there is a pathway to full legalization of all drugs. I think that in concept, they should all be legal. But I think that, uh, you know, a hardcore legalization, especially an isolated one, um, like one state or one city or whatever, has a recipe for fucking disaster. So we'll talk about that a little bit. It's a, uh, it's a principled thing. Mm. We've got... Um, Texas arguing with the appeals court over their border law saying, maybe we will are not the best thing to do at appeals court. I know the lawyer's trying to do, but uh, we'll talk about that a little bit because they are arguing for their border law and, and it hinges on this question of, does it interfere with federal immigration enforcement? So we'll talk about that a little bit, not super long. And then uh, over the weekend, the story over the weekend, earlier this week, God, I don't even know what day it is. I guess it's Wednesday. I guess it's Wednesday. Um, had a, I've already had like a 10 day week and it's only three days in, but, um, we're going to talk about this uh, teenager who's kidnapped. The police go to recover her. And in true government fashion, they do good enough for government work and they shoot the teenager, uh, while she's following lawful orders. Allegedly, allegedly, I haven't watched the video. We'll probably have to watch that one over on rumble. Cause it'll be later in the show. So ooh, that's the show we got. But the first thing we're going to do uh, as people realize, oh, he is streaming and isn't dead, damn it. Um, we're going to talk about uh, this thing that happened earlier today, which is, is literally why I'm late. Uh, I was getting ready for the show. I was already late, but I was like reasonably late, you know, like one minute. I was going to be like one to five minutes late, like normal. Not like 15 to 20 minutes late, like normal, like one to five minutes late. That was the, because uh, I'm always just running a little behind. Um, I'm running a little behind. Joe Biden is usually chasing a little behind. So there's a difference there. But uh, I was running a little behind. And then uh, I got caught up in a discussion with Lady Rackets about this thing that happened today. Um, at uh, I can't give, I, I can't be explicit on location or whatever. But uh, one of my children, my children go to uh, some Christian based activities, right? Christian based activities uh, where they can get some, you know, good Jesus education, all that good stuff. Okay. And so I got wrapped up into recapping with Lady Raggett's what happened to one of my children today at this thing. And um, it, uh, it goes to this disconnect that I have with American Christians and why I have so many troubles with uh, church people and stuff like that. And um, I ended up getting very, very like angry, visibly angry. And I had to settle down quite a bit. Uh, before coming on the show, because I was not, um, I, I couldn't even talk. Like, I'm enraged. I'm still mad. I'm still mad. So we're going to do that. I want to hit the Super Chats first. We'll hit those, and then we'll do the story real quick. We'll incorporate that into the show, and then we'll get into the main topics. It shouldn't take too long, but I think it's an important thing, and it's something people should know about me, 
And uh, I see, look, I see the rise on the right of superficial and vain Christianity. It scares the shit out of me. Um, it's haughty. It's egotistical. It's uh, relentless. It's comedic. It is funny, but it, it really, it really tugs at like what core Christianity is. And, um, the politicization of Christian faith bothers me because it, it should stretch you out of your politics a little bit, at least in your personal life. And, uh, that's, that's what's really confusing as to how this is manifesting in this way where it, it actually uh, is super aligning with a certain political ideology from people who don't seem to believe what they're talking about either. And um, I know they're, they're colleagues of mine who boast post frequently about their Christian faith with cool little verses and shit. And uh, they go on, they go on shows and they, talk about very strong values about like uh, porn or whatever, right? They do this all the time. And I don't know. I just, for me, it falls flat. For me, it falls a little flat, but uh, maybe for you guys, it's different. So let's hit these supers and we'll do that. And then we'll, uh, we'll get into the rest of the show. Mich Mitchell Black says, Nick, I'm about to break into your home and remove all the light switches unless you get your nasty butt on here. So who needs lights? Uh, John Doe says, Gate and Lay. That's true. Uh, Mitchell Black also says, F in chat. Also says, uh, Nick, you're literally worse than Hitler for making me wait. I just made you wait for the train. Uh, John Doe, here goes. I have a friend with a YouTube channel that is under attack by annoying haters. They spend money on bots and stuff. Wow, it's dedicated. Do you know anyone slash resources to help with that? Obviously willing to pay. Can I connect? contact uh, Twitter maybe? Cheers. Oh, you can contact me on Twitter. I don't really know who would help with that. You have to get the identities of the people involved. Um, I know someone who's done that in regards to some attacks on Reddit, but it takes a lot of money and long time, and usually it's not going to work out the way you want it to. So, uh, The Iceman, 101418, says, You don't owe chat jack, Nick. Uh, I get it sucks. Screw the haters. Just got back from church as well about 30 minutes ago. However, I'm in California. No, I... Uh, I don't owe anybody this story. I just wanted to tell it because it just happened and it was useful to me. And it's useful. Um, I think it's useful for other people. The late thing is entirely my fault. It's just, uh, I'm not like blaming anybody for it. I got really pissed off though. And so I wanted to share. Uh, Angel Australia, 16 month member chat says, let's see if I'm a new member again. Not new. Look, I'm, I misread it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I did misread it. My apologies last time. But thank you for reminding me that you're not a new member. Um, hey, what's up, Megan Fox? I think you're in chat there. Does someone say? I think. Are you Are you in chat? I can't even see. Maybe you're in there. Oh, there you are. Uh, no, um, Megan Fox, let's set up a show time to talk about that uh, case. She wants me to talk about this case that she thinks is funny. I don't know. Um, but there's a, there's a woman claiming a guy... Uh, how do I impregnated her orally with twins or whatever? <laughs> because that's how it works, right? Like that's a thing. And apparently this case just gets weirder and weirder as we go. So um, we'll uh, set that up as soon as, uh, as soon as I can. I, I'd asked her if she could come on tonight, uh, but she didn't respond fast enough. And then it turns out I was late enough that she could have anyway, we'll set it up for a different night. So that'll be fun. Um, okay. Here we go. The show or the, the story from today that got me real heated when I was, uh, again, recapping a day with Lady Raggets uh, before I do the show. Uh, my, as I stated, one of, my kids go to various church-based activities. Not based, but based. And um, one of my kids was uh, helping their cousin with a project and it was during one of these classes, right? Like they do the classes and then they have activity time, all that. It was during one of the classes. They're helping their cousin. Now the teacher, the leader, whatever, was talking through the little lesson that's in their books and stuff uh, while this is happening. So 
uh, the it ends up that my child is talking while the teacher is talking. I know nothing of this, as of course my entire life of being in any sort of classroom setting, I never ever spoke while someone else was speaking. That would be ridiculous. But you know, it's my child; and they haven't learned yet. So I'm I'm sitting there hearing this story, and uh, my child says, "Yeah, I'm helping my cousin," and the teacher uh, starts yelling at me. I'm like, "Wow." You must have been talking loud, you know, like, I get it. I don't really want them to yell, but I get it. And then uh, they said that they had to stay after the class and missed part of the activity time. And they're sitting there like in literal tears over this as the teacher is berating my child, saying that uh, here's what the, the teacher allegedly said. Allegedly. I guess technically I wasn't there. I'm taking the word of a child. I said, uh, Dad. They said, my entire family must be disappointed in me for how rude and disrespectful I am and that they see me and they see the potential to be kind and caring, but I'm just so rude and disrespectful that I don't make it. Uh, that's what this teacher at a church told a child. Um, Now, I am not uh, the most, I'm not the most couth man. I have a little bit, a little bit of a, a uh, sharp tongue sometimes. I, I may um, use a little bit of the uh, swear words, the uh, R-rated words. And I have been criticized. Um reprimanded even, we'll say, by people in the church, uh, in this same church, uh, for for things like that. Things I don't say around children, um, things I don't say at church, things I say, you know, maybe on the show or elsewhere. Uh, some people have, have taken umbrage, umbrage with some of the uh, quote-unquote vulgarity. And I've seen this, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about with a, a uh, sort of egotistical Christian Christianity rising up is this vain and superficial thing where you have this set of uh, rules of arbitrary um, requirements like uh, you can't use this type of word because if you say fuck, then that's a sin somehow because Paul once said uh, something about watching what comes out of your mouth or off your tongue and never let... Never let profanity or vulgarity come off of your tongue. Something like that. And so therefore, you can't say uh, shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker. You can't say any of those things, right? Um, because if you do, that's not Christian. That word itself is an unchristian word. And, um, and I'm sitting here going, no. No, that's just, those are just syllables and letters. Those don't mean anything. You have to give them meaning in how you use them. Like, uh, if I just say shit, fuck ass like that, it doesn't mean anything at all. But if you say fuck you to someone and you're serious, like, well, you're either getting sex or like uh, telling them to piss off. That's different. Like, and if you use these things in anger, or, you know, frustration or to tear people down, of course that can be much more of a problem. To me, telling a child something like that, that's vulgarity. Like that is profanity. That is, that is the dialogue that is unbecoming of, of Christian leadership. I Look, I don't even like kids. I wouldn't say that to some kid. Ever. Ever. And it fucking pisses me off that, like, we're always asked, uh, not asked, if you go to any church community and damn near anyone, there's a list of expectations and guidelines that have nothing to do with uh, biblicism, biblical principles, nothing to do with Christianity, nothing to do with the faith-based morality, nothing to do with anything like that. They're uh, imposed upon them because it's a list of Karens who've come up with rules that are extra, and they just throw those on there. And if you don't conform to those rules, well, uh, that's, that's the thing, right? That's the problem. The rules that people make up that, that have nothing to do 
with reality or anything of import. And uh, that shit, look, don't fuck around with my kids. Um, my kids are pretty damn amazing. They're way better people than me. Thank God. Uh, but they're all exceptionally smart. They're well, very well communicative. And they're good. Like, not like... They're like actually good. They like people. They treat them well. They treat them too well. Gotta tell them, like, will you just be mad at someone for once, like, or get pissed off? They're just good. I don't know how. Probably YouTube or something, like someone else that they're watching. But there, there are, they're good people. And so to have some random church Karen say that shit, this is a person who has like a relationship with my child. Like they see them all the time. They've become like a, they become like this, you know, one year sort of uh, person to speak into their life. Like you have the capacity to do damage. Damage to people when you're put into a position of trust and authority over someone. And, and then to do that, over something is flipping to some kid, like a kid's talking over you in your like fake little classroom. Like that's it. That's what, that's who you're going to judge. This okay, cool. Great. Great. Get the fuck out. Mm. Anyway, I was a little heated. I was a little heated. Anyway. So, there you go. I just wanted to kind of, uh, again, I, I don't talk about uh, faith stuff too much. And I, I talk about a lot how I kind of don't always belong in the church. People don't um, agree with me on certain principles or maybe how I, how I do things. I don't know. Like, I don't do them at church and I don't impose on anybody. Uh, but they're like, oh, well, you this or that. And it's like, well, I just don't fucking care what you are. Maybe you should try that. Anyway. Yeah, there we go. Speaking of drugs, let's get on to our first story. Okay. I hope you uh, enjoyed my story. It's a true story. And then, and then my two-year-old said, Dad, we need to talk about defenestration problems in the Middle East. I was like, shut up. Uh, just kidding. Here we go. Have you guys heard of uh, this state, Oregon? Oregon, Massachusetts? It, um, it tried this thing out. It tried this thing out that says... Uh, like, hey, we're going to decriminalize hard drugs. They're like, oh, like weed? And they're like, nah, like crack. Well, what about heroin? Yeah, that too. It seems bold. I mean, it seems bold. And now it's been, uh, it's been a while. And they're like, you know what? Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't have done that. So now they've passed a new bill recriminalizing the hard drugs, which is kind of funny. Um, the Iceman uh, 101418 says, uh, Nick is a minister. I'd recommend that teacher to meet with the church leadership. You don't do that to a kid unless you want them to hate church. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I Here's the thing. So uh, just to the Iceman as a minister, uh, one of the things that I am always hesitant to do is like, do the whole like uh, narc Karen thing. I don't do that. Like I don't go, oh, this person did this or this or this. It's not my style. I'm trying to figure out how to approach this one because um, I'm unhappy. The signing of this bill ends the liberal drug policy and will take effect in September. Who? Is, why, why does this person look like this? Uh, oh my God, what a fucking... <laughs> Hold on. Uh, I always forget that Fox News, you can, you can look at anything on the fucking phone, but you get to a computer. No, you can't do that. Can't do it if you're on a computer. So here we go. Bring this back up. Uh, Oregon has legislatively completed its U-turn of a short-lived liberal policy. Decriminalize the possession of small amounts of certain drugs. Oregon governor... Tina Kotek, a Democrat. Oh, Democrats hate drugs and drug people. 
That means they hate the poor. Uh, on Monday, signed into a law, a bill that reverses Measure 110, a 2020 law that voters approved to decriminalize most illegal possession of controlled substance offenses and redirect much of the state's marijuana tax revenue to fund grants for addiction services. Wait, well, I, I guess. Around 58% of Oregon residents approved the initial measure, but since then, addiction and overdose deaths have skyrocketed. Wow. Look, if you're going to decriminalize hard drugs, you have to expect, you have to expect that you're going to be, uh, what? <laughs> what's the... What's the fuck? Harvesting the wheat, or so to speak. Like, you're going to, there's going to be a reaping. There will be a toll taken on the impoverished communities surrounding the local burning oil barrel. They're going to go because that's the, that's it. They're like, oh, wait, I can just get this all the time? Cool. Did. So that's the, that's the thing. This is the conflict of like libertarianism with uh, with civilized society that people always come up against. You go, well, wait, if you decriminalize drugs, a bunch of people are going to die. Libertarians like, yeah. Probably. <laughs> Probably going to die. Yeah, a bunch of them, like at least 70 or whatever. And are you okay with that? And the libertarian has to say yes. Like, well, how? Shouldn't we save them? And you go, why should we save them? Well, because they're people. I don't know, I guess. But why do we have to, like, why does government have to save them? Why does the government have to save them by putting them in jail? How is that the answer? And uh, it's kind of a tough question for people. They get very uncomfortable with people, like, dropping over in the street from needles in their arms and stuff. Now, that's the bigger problem. Like, from a government standpoint, the bigger problem is that you might have dead bodies in the street. Uh, you might have needles and shit lying all over the floor. It gets kind of dangerous, and that starts to be a risk to other people. But who cares if it's a risk to the user of the drug? Like, that's your choice to do that, right? Like, well, you get to put that in your body. I don't know if I recommend it, but if you want to, I guess you do. And why do we care? Why do we care what someone does in that regard? And you might. You might have a reason to care, right? And you might have a reason for government to care. But this is kind of the libertarian position. And as it turns out, society isn't ever comfortable with the libertarian position. It's kind of funny. Because it's like, well, this is the one that you ask for in every other context. Why not this one? Like, well, but we didn't think everybody would die. Though. I was like, why not? People are kind of dumb. They, they do all sorts of stupid shit. So here we go. Um, in, uh, but see, here we go. This is actually this is actually part of the problem with the statistics they just used. Around 58% of Oregon residents approved the initial measure, but since then, addiction and overdose deaths have skyrocketed in Oregon and nationwide as fentanyl swept across the country. So is this a failure of the policy or just one of those correlative, correlative increases that go along with fentanyl? Who knows? In August, 56% of Oregonians said they disapproved the pioneering drug law and both Republicans and Democrats introduced legislation to roll back the controversial measure. Now, maybe they disagree with it because, um, you know, your streets start to be garbage. That'd be a good reason. But if the overdose, th death, overdose deaths and addiction are skyrocketing due to fentanyl, that's not the drug policy. That's the new drug problem. The new law, HB 4002, makes so-called personal use possession a misdemeanor, punishable by up to six months in jail. It enables police personal use possession. Okay, that's interesting. It enables police to confiscate the drugs and crack down on their use on sidewalks and parks. Look, if you're legalizing drugs, and you're in a place where you're like, you know what I can do right now is I can just go get drugs all over the place. Where am I going to use them? God, there's a bevy of places to use these drugs. I know. I'll go to a park. No. No, pick somewhere else. I don't know, go to the library or something. 
lay on the trans book reader. You're in Oregon after all. And do your drugs on the trans book reader in front of the children. Do them there. Not in a park. That's disgusting. Why do they always... Why do they always choose like... <laughs> well, we're going to go to a playground. What for? Heroin. Let's give... Put all these needles in our arms. Like, oh my God. I don't know why they choose this, but they do. Any, any, uh, never mind. It also establishes ways for treatment to be offered as an alternative to criminal penalties by encouraging law enforcement agencies to create deflection programs that would divert people to addiction and mental health services instead of the criminal justice system. Thanks. These changes take effect September 1st. In a signing letter, Kotek said the law's success will depend on deep coordination between courts, police, prosecutors, defense attorneys, and local mental health providers, describing them as necessary partners to achieve the vision for this legislation. Oh, well, cool. Uh, Oregon House Republican leader Jeff Helfrich, Jeff Helfrich, said he supported the governor's decision and said it was a crucial first step toward addressing the ongoing drug crisis in the state. Republicans stood united and forced Democrats to do what Oregonians demanded. Recriminalize drugs, Helfrich said, according to KEZI. I just, I can just see him now. The chanting Oregonians out there, they sound like a mythical race from like fucking uh, Game of Thrones. The chanting Oregonians running around me like, bring back criminal penalties for drugs. We want to recriminalize drugs. Does that happen? I think it might, but I can't imagine where. I, I want to know, look, has anybody seen a pro criminalized drug rally before? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't seen that, but it's, uh, God, I, I never see these things. They're always like, bring us more penalties. Like that's usually not the, the like chance, but okay. Rep, uh, Tim Knopp, Knop, uh, another Republican echoed Helfrich's sentiments. That's because he was bought and paid for. Um, and said it brings an end to the liberal experiment, although more needs to be done to address the state's drug crisis. Oh my God. So, uh, speaking of echoing sentiments, guys, I found out something today. I found out something today. Um, this has nothing to do with, uh, well, maybe, um, someone is out there and they're on Twitter, I guess. And they've made a list of creators and companies that are in the pocket of this company called the wellness company. Um, the wellness company is, uh, I, I don't even remember. Um, I did one, an ad read for them. And so I'm on the list. I'm on the list of people who are bought and paid for and controlled by the wellness company which is cool. Uh, I found out that I'm like, actually like there's some evil corporate entity that owns me and my words. That was great to find out today. So I've been wondering like why I say the things I say. And now I found out. Mm. And, um, and so my friend's like, Hey, do you want to debunk this? Like debunk what? He's like, ah, uh, this person says you're like bought and paid for by so-and-so. I'm like, well, probably, but who? And they're like the wellness company. I was like, who? What, who's the fuck is the wellness company? And I was like, oh, wait, I think I did. I think I did an ad read for them a while back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. I, I think like, I'm pretty sure maybe. And now I got to go find the ad read that I did to see if it was like uh, one of those things like it activated an assassin or something. I'm like, well, what did the wellness company do? Like they don't sound bad. Right. But. Maybe they developed various gases for uh, shower valves or something. I, I'm not sure what the wellness company does other than like they have a, it's like a web page that has a bunch of different, um, they have some health products like uh, some like homeopathic shit or whatever. And you can do, um, you do like online face-to-face uh, -face consultations with a general practitioner doctor. If you have like a cold, you're like, no, hello doctor, I have a cold. You're like talking to him on your iPad or whatever. And they're like, oh, yeah, here's some antibiotics, but you're probably just going to, like, not need them or whatever. Like, it's that stuff from what I remember. But now I got to go back. 
And uh, because they're like, yeah, this person says like your words and stuff are controlled by them. I was like, you should probably go watch the ad. (laughs) I don't even remember what I said in it, but I bet it would indicate the other way. But now, now I got to go find it. So I'm going to try and find that thing. I just want to put it out there. I am 100% fully controlled by the wellness company. In fact, they've written every show I've done uh, for the last couple of years. If you have any problems or complaints, please email the wellness company. And just say, hey, uh, Nick Ricada of Ricada Law, um, I watch his show and uh, I hate it. And it's your fault because you bought him and paid for him and then you wrote his show and everything he's ever done. Um, And then Mondegraph should sue them too because they told me to make fun of him. So it happened. Also, the wellness company, if you have any watching, uh, I will definitely do more ad reads for you. Any number of them. They're the funniest thing in the world. I would do more ad reads now. I want to be more controlled than I did back then. So uh, please have your people talk to my people and uh, I'll do more ad reads. Um, And I want zero creative freedom on any of them because I'm sure the script you write will be just great. So there we go. I just wanted to come out with, uh, you know, really just make sure everybody knew the score. I didn't want people coming out and doing this slander stuff like, oh, he's partly bought and paid for. No, fully bought and paid for. I'm 100% in the pocket of the CEO. And I got to say, when I reach around the walls of the pocket, I'm not feeling any bulges, guys. Not at all. It's not good. Uh, let's see. So he says it brings an end to the liberal experiment, though more needs to be done to address the state drugs, state's drug crisis. So back to this thing, yes. So surprisingly, the congressman says, well, we passed a law, but we didn't pass enough of a law, so we're going to pass some more laws to address the things that we forgot to address in this law this slide isn't actually good enough. So we're going to make another one. And uh, just so you know, that's why you need to reelect me, right? Um, Because that's how it always goes. Don't ever, ever solve the- What is this? That's Tina Kotek? Oh, my God. I thought that was like... I thought that was a guy. I thought it was like the next Daily Show host or whatever. Because they're like, oh, we got to get rid of this black guy. <laughs> Let's get a white guy in there. How white? Really white. Like with white hair. Glasses like this. Which one of those fuckers wore those glasses? I don't know. Should be a Jew? Yeah, definitely. Okay, anyway. I thought Tina Kotek was going to be this like plasticky looking person up here. But no. Turns out Tina Kotek looks like a singer for a ska band. Make no mistake. Jesus Christ. This bill is not enough to undo the disaster of Measure 110. Knopf said in a statement, House Republicans are ready to continue the work we started and bring real change to Salem in the next session. (laughs) Guys, to Salem? That sounds like old school Republicanism. Well, we found out only women are drug users. (laughs) We've got pious building. I want to bring some change to Salem. Jesus. Where have we heard this before? All right. God damn. Is Salem the capital of Oregon? Is that it? I kind of don't remember. Uh, Eric PP says, can I still save 10% of my emergency wellness kit? I think so. I think if you use promo code knows. But don't tell him I said that. Because they didn't tell me to say it right now. This That was off the cuff. Everything else has been rehearsed. Even my responses to you. Salem is the governor of... Or governor. Salem's the capital of Oregon? God. I thought the homeless just set up a new capital. Uh, now that the governor has given the recriminalization bill her stamp of approval, we can finally end the chapter on Oregon's experiment with decriminalizing hard drugs. I... Here's my problem, guys. I don't get congressmen at all. Because I can't. I promise. If you could drug test those congressmen thoroughly, the Republican ones, you'd find an alarming amount of those decriminalized drugs in them. And that's not going to change when they get recriminalized. Why do these guys keep making what they do illegal? They're like, oh, yeah, we're above the law. Let's uh, let's put the poors in jail. 
So HB 4002 is not a perfect solution. No. The government can't perfectly solve the drug problem with one bill. Legislators will have much more work to do in the upcoming sessions. Reelect us. But it sets a standard for how the state should approach the drug addiction crisis by empowering law enforcement and our behavioral health systems to work together to help Oregonians struggling with chronic addiction seek life-saving treatment. Look, I take umbrage with the verbiage. If you are, let's say on a park bench, hypothetically, smoking crack and like waiting for baby carriages to come by so you can blow the crack smoke into the baby's face so you can have another crack friend as soon as they grow up and are old enough to properly use crack. So like three. If you're there and you get caught by the police and they're like, well, time for a diversion program. Go to the mental health thing so you don't go to prison. You are not seeking treatment. You are not seeking help with your chronic addiction. That's not seeking. See, seeking treatment will be looking at the crack pipe going, I'm going to smoke this crack. And I'm going to use that energy to run to the clinic to get help. That is how you seek life-saving treatment when you're on crack. You don't get arrested and then go plea into it and be like, yeah, I guess, like, because that sounds better than prison. You use the power that the drugs give you to go seek the help. I hate how they word this shit. Just be honest. Measure 110 directed hundreds of millions of dollars of the state's cannabis tax revenue toward addiction services. Well, look, do we need help getting addicted to things? Like, there's services for this? But the money was slow to get out the door. Oh, no. This never happened to government. And health authorities, already grappling with the COVID-19 pandemic, struggled to stand up the new treatments. Struggled to stand up the new treatment system? Struggled to stand up the new treatment system. Okay, when I think of standing up something, I'm going to take a minute here. Because this is... My noodle isn't noodling through the sentence as much as it should noodle. I'm going to stand up the new treatments. Like, are they asking the treatment system on a date and then standing it up? Because that's one way, like, you stand up the appointment, you don't go. The other way is to, like, physically stand it up, I guess, but that would mean it's laid down, so you got to stand up. I think they mean set up. Is that, it's got to be set up, right? Like, I'm not crazy. I am, uh, I know, I'm not, I am an idiot. Um, I'm not wrong on that. I don't think very weird. Very weird. Oh, uh, Gnostic man. Zero zero says, yes. Salem is the capital of our shithole. Well, I'm glad your shithole has a capital. <laughs> Must be a large shithole. Mine doesn't, but thank you. Uh, dusk lights. Welcome to paralegal. Thank you for joining. Stand up the new treatments. Oh, I know what happened. Someone was like, prop it up maybe. No, I think you're right. I think what happened was this is probably written by like an Arabic AI and translated into English. You know? You get those weird like, it's Fox, so it's press Saudi Arabia, I'm guessing. Um, the, the state auditors found that they failed to stand, they struggled to stand up the new treatment system. Again, can, I, I didn't even get through a new sentence. It was the same sentence as before. And I'm sorry. But I've got to... I've got to talk about... With the COVID-19 pandemic. All right. How do you fail to set up a system that uh utilizes the type of medical hair prof uh, medical hair medical health professionals that are not being used to treat covid right like an epidemiologist is not a behavioral health specialist with addiction services and neither is a general practitioner or family doctor or anybody even a fucking walgreens nurse is not the same person who's dealing with drug addiction people like the, the whole uh, column of expertise is way different here the pandemic lowered the amount of people doing other stuff. 
I guess in theory, the pandemic could have increased the amount of drug users. How did they have troubles getting this new treatment system going? That actually the best opportunity to do so, most likely, because I'm guessing they had free time, free people. Fucking uh, government can't, they can't do anything right. At the same time, the fentanyl crisis began to spark an increase in deadly overdoses. Those pressures, well, but see, all the fentanyl overdoses were just COVID deaths. Those pressures prompted Oregon Democrats to shift their stance on decriminalization policy in recent months. Kotech, Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler, and Multnomah County Chair Jessica Vega. Oh, wait, Jessica Vega Peterson. Pedersen? In February, declared a 90-day state of emergency for downtown Portland over the public health and public safety crisis fueled by fentanyl. What about, look, I haven't been to Portland. But I have been to Seattle. I think it was in 2020 I went to Seattle. And uh, the the state of emergency was not, I mean, fentanyl is probably there. Literally just homeless people everywhere. Like you, anywhere you turn, you can catch homelessness. It's terrifying. Like they come running out of your tent or their tents. Like, uh, oh, did you play those shooting games at the arcade where you're like, beep, 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 right? You do, you're doing that. And like the zombie will run up or whatever. That's what it was like walking through Seattle because you got these tents everywhere and you're just waiting for some guy with like nine bikes on the side of his tent to come out. And you're like, mm, wonder, uh, wonder what color was shooting today. Like so you're just waiting for someone to burst out of a tent and come out uh, from the basalts and stuff. It's like, that's way scarier than some people on fentanyl to me. I don't know. The public health and safety crisis fueled by fentanyl. It's not really a public safety crisis when you think about it. Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. So, but if you think about it, though, like, why is fentanyl a public health crisis? Fentanyl's... Have you guys been in the public? I've seen the public once. One time, I went outside, and there was the public. And I was like, oh, ho. That's what these guys keep talking about. Here's the public. What I was not concerned about was fentanyl affecting the public because the public isn't a drug user. Like, the public isn't buying cocaine and having fentanyl in it and dying. The public is not getting addicted to uh, opioids um, and then buying fentanyl. Like, a person is. That's not the public. That's a people. Uh, the people is going and doing the thing, not the public. The pu It's not a public health crisis. It's a public drug user health crisis, I guess. It's a drug user health crisis. So weird that they do this, though, because it's like, how on earth is the public in danger from fentanyl? The, the public isn't using opioids and abusing them and taking fentanyl. It's a small percentage of the public. Sure, they, uh, they're also publics, but like all snoots are snorts. Not all snorts are snuffs, but all snoots are snorts. So therefore, some of the snoots are also snuffs. That's how it goes, right? It's one of those logic problems. You go, how many of them died of fentanyl? All of them. Oh, well, good. I didn't like any of those people. Anna P says, uh, cheers. Cheers. I'm having wine, but still. But still what, Anna P? I uh, hope you and your family are doing well. Thank you, Anna. I hope you and your family are doing well. Doing well as well. Cheers to you. Uh, may everyone be blessed and at peace. Okay. 11 Bravo Crunchy says, stand up is also a term used when forming a new or formerly disbanded or non-existent military unit. Oh, that's cool. That's good. I wonder if this Fox writer was former military for Saudi Arabia then. Um, so here we go. The fentanyl crisis began to spark an increase in deadly overdoses. Oh, public safety crisis. The reversal bill was passed by the state Senate 21 to 8. After the House passed it 51 to 7. Democrats have majorities in both chambers. Portland private security guard. <sighs> Michael Bach told Fox News in February that fentanyl overdoses rose by 533% in Multnomah County. Guys, I want to reread that statement again 
and remind you that this is a news article written by one of the largest news organizations on the entire planet. And that their citation for a fact is this. Portland private security guard Michael Bach told Fox News in February that fentanyl overdoses rose by 533% in Multnomah County, the state's most populous county between 2018 and 2022. Dealers act with absolute impunity, he said, and hand out drugs like they are a 7-Eleven. So right, now you don't have to go to the 7-Eleven to get your drugs. You just go to the dealer who is like a 7-Eleven to get your drugs. Analogies to the 7-Eleven from the private security guard, the highly educated uh, poet laureate private security guard saying, look, drug dealers are just like 7-Elevens because the drug dealers are handing out so much drugs, they're comparable to a 7-Eleven handing out drugs. Ignore that. Ignore that. And let's go back to the fact that the guy that they're using for their drug statistics with a kind of pretty precise statistic, 533%, is Michael Bach, the Portland private security guard. And you're like, wait, where did Michael Bach get this data? Did he, did a lo- did he do a longitudinal study of uh, or, or survey, I guess, of overdose admissions in hospitals in Multnomah County over a four-year period? Is that what he did? Did he do that as part of his graduate degree? Like, why is a private security guard being cited for a 533% increase in overdoses? This doesn't make any sense. Is he a professor of the economics of drug abuse and drug policy? No. Is he the department chair? Is he the department chair of the University of Oregon's drug prevention uh, symposium? Like, what the fuck is this? Why is that? Why does this sentence exist in a legitimate news article? Why? Arclight says, maybe look into him instead of just scoffing like a retard. No, it doesn't matter. He might be the most qualified person on the planet. List the qualifications of why we should listen to a private security guard. But let's check it out. I will do it. Here we go. Portland. Security guard. Michael Bach. Remember, he told Fox News back in February that this happened. Uh Uh-oh. It's a New York Times article. (laughs) No, 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 it's too funny. No, please. Please hold on. Please be him. Please, for the love of God, be him. I can't. I've seen this guy at the donut shop just fucking begging, begging the donut shop to change their policies. This can't be him. Hold on. It's too funny. (laughs) This is him. This is him. Oh, Oh, baby. Guys. Private security. Michael Bach. Enemy of the bagel shop. Hero of the vegan section where no food gets purchased. Just like blacks after the 13th amendment never bought again private security guard michael buck let me tell you about overdoses i have one on insulin (laughs) (laughs) why the changer of ways it's not the changer of ways. He's a consumer of lays. Look at this. Okay. Michael Bach, security guard with Echelon Protective Services, checked on a man after reviving him from an overdose during a 12-hour shift. Good job, Michael Bach. Arclight understands me. Fat, so opinion in the bin. Yes. This man had an overdose on Cheerios this morning. Okay, I, guys, I love the New York Times. I love them. I love them. Hold on. I love the New York Times. Can we, for just a minute, zoom in and recognize that this article was written by Eli Saslow and Aaron Schaff. Now, 
I want you, without thinking too hard, to pick which one of those is the man named Eli and which one of those is the woman named Aaron. I'll wait an eternity for you to be able to definitively say, look, they're the same person. They share clothes. <laughs> I can't. Uh, Eli Saslow. Let's just be happy that Levitican law doesn't apply anymore, my friend. Because every time you lay with a man, not sure what would happen. Jesus Christ, look at the, oh God. Aaron Shaft just looks like Eli's twink and he looks like someone else's twink. It's like a chain of twinks going down from the fattest, grossest, hairiest gay all the way down to Aaron Shaft. Oh my God. My God. <laughs> God, why? Okay, okay, okay. Why? Why is it like this? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Look, sometimes I read something and I have, like, I have to laugh. I have to laugh, and I'm sorry. Um, Eli Saslow and Aaron Schaff spent dozens of hours shadowing Michael Bach. Yeah. How could you do anything other than shadow Michael Bach? When you're around him, you can't find the sun. It's, it's impossible. Because <laughs> the sun like you is impossible to find. <laughs> you're impossible to find. When you're around Michael Bach, all you can do is go, where, where'd the sun go? God, now is the winter of my discontent. I, I'm in Alaska in the winter, I guess. You can't do anything other than shadow this guy. On his shifts as a private security guard in downtown Portland, Oregon. He's always shifting into a lower gear, especially when he looks uphill at the donut stand. Oh, my God. Uh, Michael Bach was still on his way. See, now I want to know about this article. This is a long time ago. He was still on his way to work for his shift as a private security guard when he came upon his first emergency of the day. Was it his first emergency of the day? It's not really his emergency, right? Because they're going to talk about some guy overdosing. But that guy's having the emergency. Michael Boggs is having a day walking around Portland, finds an, you know, an overdosing guy. That's just normal. He drove into downtown Portland, Oregon a little after 6 a.m. Why, why are there commas on that? Okay, so commas are for an i think it's called an appositive or an apposition but a little after 6 a.m is an apposition so an apposition is a set of extra information that explains a thing but it, it's removed from the sentence and if you remove it from the sentence the sentence goes on now if you remove this phrase from the sentence it's an unnecessary phrase a little after 6 a.m except it isn't unnecessary you don't need a comma and then a comma because yeah if you remove it the sentence still flows, but it's a necessary detail about the sentence, not about the prior clause. So would you say, if you say he drove into downtown Portland, Oregon, then you have comma, he drives into downtown Portland every Wednesday, comma, something like that. Downtown Portland, Oregon, comma, Oregon's a city in, uh, or a city in, uh, or wait, a state in the United States, right? Like if you're in Saudi Arabia where this is written, that's where you would have those things. This isn't a... You don't need this. This is the New York Times. This is the New York Times. This is the gold standard. The gold standard. Where we are. The, you know, the gold standard. The interest and the user of journalism. And these guys are definitely good Jews. How do they not know grammar? And you saw a man swinging a hatchet and chasing someone into the street. As one does. If you're swinging a hatchet, are you not chasing someone into the street? And if you're not, you have to ask yourself why. Bach, 46. <laughs> he looks like a TV character. He looks like all of the TV characters of one sitcom in one. <laughs> Come on. Come on. <laughs> Where's his neck? He doesn't have a neck. He has a child's torso under his chin. And then he has a man's torso under that. A fat man's torso. A Batman's. 
Look, God damn it. The back of his head has its own chin. <laughs> Look. Oh, my God. Guys. So there's a man swinging a hatchet, chasing someone into the street. Bach 46, he bravely pulls over. He rolled down his window because he can't open the door and get out in time. There's no way this man is dismounting his Toyota Yaris or whatever he's driving and running this guy down. So he rolls down his window like an elderly woman. He says, security, can we please settle down? Let me guess, it worked. Eli Saslow is in the trunk of the Toyota Yaris. Aaron Schaff is in the closet, still at home. He yells, can we please settle down? There's a guy trying to murder someone with a hatchet. It's like, hey, 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 can we knock that shit off just a little bit? Like, please, just calm down. Like, take your hatchet, swing it nicely with respect. What are we doing? What? <laughs> he put his hands on my drugs! The man with the hatchet shouted. As this one does. I'm going to kill him. He jabbed his weapon at the air as the person he was chasing picked up a rock. He's like, hatchet boys. Like what? Jabbed it at the air. Guys, what is happening? This is a story they're writing. Like this, Eli Saslow is like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to write about that, the guy with the hatchet. And Aaron Schaff's like, oh, are we sure we want to write? Like, that was weird. Like, this guy didn't even get, he just yelled from the window. Yeah, that's brave. He had a hatchet, not like a gun. <laughs> yeah, he could have walked slowly at him with a hatchet and Bach wouldn't have been able to get away. He put his hands on my drugs. Jabbed his weapon in the air. Person he was chasing picked up a rock. Bach watched them circle each other and dialed 911. <laughs> Guys, listen to the high praise of the security guard's first emergency of the day. This is his, his first emergency of the day, implying he will have many other emergencies during the day, implying that this is how he will handle those as well. He drives his car near them, rolls down the window, says, hey, hey, stop, stop, you guys. And then he calls 911. Quote, a call taker will be with you as soon as possible. The recording said he got voicemailed and he waited on hold. He waited on hold. As he steered his car farther into the street, wedging it between the two men. Honking his horn and sending them off in opposite directions as a dispatcher answered the line. What a fucking hero. What a hero. Did he get out and take the hatchet from the guy? No. Did he get out and catch the rock like in a like an amazing shortstop, barehanding it because he didn't have the glove because it fell right before the play? No, he wedged his car because <laughs> you know the steering wheel is right in front of his tits, right? Like so he's like turning into the street slowly. And he's got to be in a big fucking Buick. He has to be in a big. I said Toyota Yaris is a joke because he's got. He's got to be in a big car, like a LeSabre from like, LeSabre, I get it. It's a LeSabre from like 2015. Turning that thing in like, come on, guys. Don't hatchet that man to death. I know he touched your drugs. He put his hands on my drugs. He didn't even get his drugs. He just put his hands on them. This isn't a theft. This is an unwanted touching of drugs. This guy is going to tell us about the drug crisis. Watch. Quote, we had two transients in a street fight, but it looks like they're dispersing. Brock said, he uses tactical. Of course he does. Of course he does. Guys, he, uh, we had two transients in a street fight, but it looks like they're dispersing. You could hear it, right? Like, He's the guy who's got, he'd have on like the triangular Oakleys right now that don't go over the ear. They just, they just kind of loop out and press back in back. In. Like, and cause if you're fat, if you're a fat guy, look, you fat guys know this, you know, this, you got that, that like head fat on the side, like where your face becomes the donuts you eat. 
but not the like, like not with the, you don't have a donut hole because you weren't in Vietnam or whatever, but you have the full like that you're jelly filled, you know it, and you got that fat thing. And if you get just a straight back, like a straight back around the ear, uh, <laughs> sunglasses, you can't do that because your your fat will poke out around them, like it'll look like an ass crack on the side of your head, like a small one, like a white guy one, and like. That'll be there. So you can't do that. You have to have the Oakleys that come around and poke back in. So you just have like the gravity well where your Oakleys hit the back of your head and your head fat gets pushed in so your glasses don't fall off. And I know all of you have seen this because I know all of you have been to a water park that's outdoors once. Once in your life, you've seen this. You're like, oh, yeah. Or an outdoor mall in the South. You know, the ones where it's like opening. It's, it's like, it's a mall, but you're like just walking down. Like it's two strip malls next to each other with no street. It's like, that's not an outdoor mall. A mall has hallways and like sad teenagers. This doesn't have any of that. This is just terrible. It's hot and miserable. I'm in Alabama. Like you're just walking around. But you've seen that guy. He's sweating like a fucking bear. He's wearing a t-shirt that says something about Sturgis on it. But he doesn't have a motorcycle, right? Like, he doesn't have that. And he's wearing khakis. And you're like, that doesn't fit the Sturgis shirt. You should be wearing cool stuff. Like leather and, like, the skin of your enemies. But no. No. You're walking around with, like, one Sturgis shirt that you got while driving through. But you drove through Sturgis in, like, January. So there weren't any bikers there. Because you're that fat. Like, you're scared. You're like, God, if... If I'm this fat and they think I have a motorcycle, it's like a $150,000 Harley because it's the only thing that can carry me around. It's not, that's not it. So he's sitting there. I'm, okay, I'm over describing this, but you have to have the picture. And then he's using Tactical because he's a security guard, which is kind of like a cop in my right? Like, hey, yeah, we deal with, we deal with emergencies just like you guys. And the New York cops like, yeah, when you black guys, did you stop and frisk today? Only on duty answers, please, Mister Bach. And he's like, none. They're like, yeah, because we go into neighborhoods full of them, and you just sit in a building or drive around. He's like, we had two transients in a street fight, but it looks like they're dispersing. How does he know they're transients? Transient, transient. Not lasting, enduring, or permanent, transitory, lasting only a short time, existing briefly, temporary, transient authority. How does he know these people are transient? So a transient is like a, like a roaming drifter, right? Like that's a transient. Homeless people aren't transients. Homeless people are just homeless. They're permanent. They're around there all the time. They're just sitting around in tents and on like stolen uh, North Face equipment and stuff. Like they're not transients, but they're dispersing they went, the, uh, they went the opposite directions from your stupid car, dude. A, a car horn stopped this fight. All clear, the dispatcher asked. Bach glanced back toward the street where one man was about to get on a bicycle with what appeared to be a gash on his arm. Eli got really excited for the gash. And the other was still carrying a hatchet and muttering to himself as he headed down a popular jogging trail. Oh, so the hatchet man was a jogger. Wasn't he? And his name, say his name, Ahmaud Arbery. His name was Ahmaud Arbery. I guess so, Bach said, for now. Why for now? Why for now? Wait. Wait a minute. We had, past tense, two transients in a street fight, but it looks like they're dispersing. All clear? I guess so. For now. <laughs> oh, yes, the two dispersing transients have actually set an appointment to come back to the same place and resume their street fight. The fuck is this guy? What is this article? Do you realize, guys, that someone reads this and goes, these are New York, and this is what New York is like? Portland, I guess Oregon it's like. Uh, he hung up and continued driving into one of the many American downtowns. Not one of the many American downtowns, into Portland. Downtown Portland. That's not one of the many American downtowns. That's just downtown Portland. Downtown Portland doesn't exist outside of Portland. I don't know if you guys know this, but there's only downtown Chicago. That's not, Chicago is not 
the same as downtown Miami. Very different. Not the same as downtown Houston, Dallas, Portland, Seattle, uh, LA. These are all wildly different places where one crisis now spirals into the next as spiking rates of homelessness, drug overdoses, violent crime, and psychosis threaten to overwhelm the public safety infrastructure once considered basic to the country's major cities. Average police response times have increased by as much as 50% over the last several years in dozens of places. Why? Including New York City, New Orleans, and Nashville. In Portland, a record-breaking number of daily emergencies has strained every part of the system. 911, hashtag never forget. Hold times have quintupled since 2019. The average police response has slowed to nearly an hour. Firefighters work overtime to handle more overdoses than actual fires. You know what? Uh, unpopular opinion. Unpopular opinion. I want more overdoses than actual fires. Has anybody thought through that statement? I would rather the fire department deal with 50 overdoses in one day, then one fire, then one fire. Fires are terrible. Overdoses are, well, bad for you, I guess. Like that's a problem for the person overdosing and their family, sure. But fires are really bad for everybody. Anyway, God damn it. Uh, and each week there are no ambulances left to respond to hundreds of medical emergencies. That's right. Guys, every week they run out of ambulances. There's none left. I mean, next week they'll get new ambulances, but each week they just run out. <laughs> Where? How do you run out of ambulances? Where'd they go? There's none left. Oh, well then. It's just weirdly written. Weirdly, like, I know what they're saying. It's just oddly worded. What has arrived into the void? What? What void? Guys, what void? There's not a void of firefighters. There's not a void of police. Just because there's not enough is not a void. If there were none, there'd be a void. That would be a void. God damn it. Are thousands of private security guards hired by office buildings? Guys, office buildings are now hiring private security guards. The buildings are. Coffee shops, stores, schools. Well, we learned from that Google case that some people identify as ornate buildings, so maybe. And parking lots. What has become one of the country's fastest growing industries? With annual revenue exceeding $40 billion. Most major U.S. cities now have at least three times as many security guards on the street as sworn police officers. They're not, they're actually, they're not on the street. They're not on the street. Security guards are on private property. That's not the street. That's public property. Fucking hell. And that should be the case. Private security should definitely outnumber sworn police officers. You know why? Government is shit. They're bad at everything. Sorry, police. You're bad at your job. You're really bad at your job, actually. Your, your job is investigatory and to actually, like, serve warrants. Your job isn't to serve and protect in the way you trying to make it. That's why you keep killing black people. Even though guards typically, oh shit, I clicked the wrong button. Typically operate with minimal oversight, less training, and little power to enforce the law. Bach patrolled the city each morning on behalf of Echelon Protective Services in his family's 2006 minivan. <laughs> why did they say car? Guys, they said his car. They were lying. This man, this is 2006. What is it? What is it? Is it a Ford Windstar? Is that what he's driving around like a 2006 Ford Windstar? Is it a Chrysler town and country? And when you say town and country, you mean a town and country's food supply going into this fat motherfucker's gullet? Oh, he's a 2006. Without the benefit of a lights or a siren, lights or a siren. Why would he have lights or a siren? He's not a patrol officer. He's not sworn and empowered to protect the fucking streets. He doesn't have the rights of le people infused into him by a constitution that allows that to happen. 
He's just a guy hired by a private company to be around something. Why is he on the street? Jesus Christ. Well, private's here. Rolling down his window co to cajole people in behavior with a mixture of charm, intimidation, commiseration, and free cigarettes. He doesn't have food to give, though. He doesn't have food to give. Guarantee that. Run and tell that. He's to cajole. He's a cajoler. These are the stories they tell. There are 38 people named Michael Bach in one body. This is their story. His job was mostly, mostly to help businesses deal with the impacts of public drug use and erratic behavior. And over the last few years, he'd come to know dozens of regular offenders by name. Guys, hit me with your best in chat. Both chats. I see three chats, I guess. I see all of you. Hit me with your best repeat drug offender name. Hit me with... Fuck. I know what I just said, but hit me with the funny ones. There was Stephanie who sometimes stole diapers for a newborn baby that existed only in her mind. Hey, Eli. She didn't steal diapers for a newborn baby that existed only in her mind. She stole diapers to trade them for food stamps or for money so she could buy crack. It's not hard. This isn't even fucking hard. The number of Nick Ricadas in chat are making me really frustrated right now, but I love you. I love all of you. Um, Obama's drone striking all of your houses. And Christopher, whom Bach had resuscitated after an overdose, only to see him smoking fentanyl again an hour later. Okay. Look. <sighs> Hold on. Guys, if you go into Google and you type in smoking fent, you don't get smoking fentanyl as like an even a common result. How, how do you do, do people smoke fentanyl? I guess. Injecting carries the highest risk for overdose. Well, usually, I guess. So shifting to snorting or smoking may help reduce risk. I didn't know. I've never, uh, I've never even seen fentanyl, much less. If I saw it, you know, I, I, when I, I wouldn't do. I would not look at a fentanyl that comes in pill form. I'd not go, you know what I want to do? Usually crush that up and smoke it. It's not, that's not what I would think. Like, I, I'd see a pill, like if I was going to take a pill, if, I'd be like, you know what, here's a pill. Simple, right? I'm not a complicated man. Uh, Brax says they smoke it on a tinfoil slide sometimes. They should smoke it on that really hot fucking playground slide. You don't even have to have fire for that. Uh, let's see. He, he resuscitated him after an overdose, only see him smoking fentanyl again an hour later. And Stephen, Stephen and Stephanie, very close, who had a history of violence like, uh, who's that? Oh, uh, Vigo Mortensen. And was now standing naked in the middle of Third Avenue, wearing only his left sneaker. That's not naked. That's wearing a left sneaker. Gyrating <laughs> and yelling something about how he was a sumo wrestler. I don't see any problem with this. Bach pulled over and dialed the police department. The police department's non-emergency line to report a mental health crisis. What's the crisis? Look, a guy naked in... Portland isn't that's like that's not out of the ordinary at all and a guy naked who's like singing about how he's a sumo wrestler isn't that's not a mental health crisis the mental health crisis is being in Portland saying I'm a Republican way worse than what that guy's going through but the call was disconnected he called again and waited through a series of recordings when call volume exceeds the number of available phone lines your call may be disconnected the recording said and the line went dead are you kidding me? Box said to who? The, the recording wasn't listening in the first place, buddy. And they, the recording hung up on you just like your ex-wife. He sometimes waited on hold for several hours for a non-emergency call. He never waited on hold for the pizza restaurant. He watched Steven sit in the tra street as traffic backed up behind him. And with no other solution in sight, Bach 
walked into the road. He was six foot five and more than 350 pounds. Hold on. No. He wasn't more than 350 pounds. I don't believe it. They could have said this man was five foot two and more than 350 pounds. I would have never had a doubt in my mind. Never once would I have thought, you know what? I don't believe him. Of course, this Jesus Christ. He put this earpiece in his head in 1987. It just, his skin grew around it. He can't take it out. It's there forever. Oh, God. Armed with a gun, pepper spray, and an expertise in jujitsu. I can't. I can't. I can't do it. I cannot do it. Oh. He's got an expertise in jujitsu. Does he? Does he? Well, he's immune to chokeholds. He has ablative tissue blocking his carotid artery. In his jugular. He cannot be submitted. Okay. Guys, we got to flip to Rumble. We got to do it. I thought I would get through this. I, I can't. This guy is too fucking stupid. This is the drug overdose. Again, I get it. This guy deals with drug overdoses all the time. He's going to talk. He's going to speak with authority on statistics on drug use. And where's he get them? He read a study somewhere. Tell me how he conducted the study. Tell me why. Like, why is this guy telling us? Why are you citing this? God damn it. All right. We're going to do the rumble transition. Just a second. Uh, Anna P. Oh, hey. I live in Los Angeles. Los Angeles. This fentanyl BS has gotten way out of control. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fentanyl is terrible. Don't get me wrong. Democrats have ruined L.A. and California. It sucks to have common sense. Living in a Looney Tunes city state, I hope people wake up. Oh, you're in California, honey. It's not going to happen. Anna P. says, also, I found your channel back during the beginning of the Rittenhouse trial. You're one of the reasons I question everything now. I used to be a lefty. Oh, hey. Thank you for continuing to give us amazing content. Nose. Thank you, Anna. I really appreciate that. And I'm glad that you are here. Look, I don't care where people end up on issues. I only care that they do so intelligibly. So glad to hear that that's, uh, that's working for you. 11 Bravo Crunchy says, random question. Nick, what the fuck is wrong with Minnesota Department of Transportation? On Tuesday, I saw two MnDOT snow plows on I-90 plowing bare fucking pavement. Plows down, sparks flying. That sounds like a Taylor Swift song. Not putting down salt. MnDOT is run by retards. In high school, I, uh, I had a class with a guy who was a plow driver. So he's 18, I think. I, he might have been held back, but I think he was 18. Plow driver, and he just uh, talked about how he would drink beer driving a snowplow all the time. That's fine. Uh, Eric Kaya says, boss's babies, boss babies mocap act. Actually kind of looks like him. Lem Bravo Crunchy says, did these New York Times writers forget about the hashtag defund the police that they were probably personally screeching in 2020? What did they think was going to happen? Faster police response times. Um, everyone should remember that police response times are not in the original police job description. That was never a thing because there wasn't an ability to do so. Hallucinosis. Uh, says, according to Wesley Wills, a Ford Windstar. It was a Ford Windstar. Oh, God. I drove one of those for a while. My parents had, they bought two Ford Windstars while I was a teenager. First one was light blue. Second one was red. They both were uncool. Both of them were uncool. And guys, oh. All right, we're going to switch to Rumble. I'll see you guys in just, well, I'll see you guys over there. If you're on YouTube, links in the description or the pin chat, come join us on Rumble. We'll go for, uh, you know, we got a little bit more show left, of course. After the switch, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'll be back in a minute, but we'll hit that. See you in just a second, guys. Thanks for watching. Click like on the way out on YouTube. And uh should have a show tomorrow. It's Thursday. Should be. I'm sure something's going to fuck it up. But...
We're going to have a show anyway. Catch you guys later. See you on Rumble exclusively, of course. Peace. Peace. Peace.